ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alan Weehart. You are listening to Crystal Kids TV. My website is www.crystalkidsradio.com. You can check out other archives and you can also donate on my website to help support independent broadcasters. All donations are greatly appreciated. Today I have a special guest by the name of Andrew Goff. Andrew and I will be discussing the hidden hive of history, the forgotten god of the ancients. Andrew is a writer, presenter, and editor of a heretic magazine. This magazine has many great viewpoints that are informative. Andrew has been featured in several documentaries, and Andrew has also written a free plus series of articles on his website, www.andrewgoff.co.uk. It's spelled G-O-U-G-H. So, one more time, G-O-U-G-H. And this three-part series of articles is called Be Dazzled, Be Wildered, and Be Garden. That was well-researched and informative. I would like to introduce my special guest, Andrew Goff, to Crystal Kiss TV. Hello, Andrew. How are you doing today? Thank you for making time in your busy schedule to come. It's really great to be here, Natalie Marie. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be on your show. Yes, it's, oh, it's a pleasure. Could you please tell us about the Heretic Magazine and what inspired you to begin in? Could you please tell us about the documentaries you were featured on, too? Uh, sure, I'd be delighted to. So uh, the Heretic Magazine, for which I'm the editor, is a magazine that really features a lot of new voices, voices that wouldn't otherwise have uh, a chance to be published or a chance to be heard. And, and the whole notion of a heretic, sometimes people get sort of negative connotations about that, but it's just the opposite. It's somebody who believed so strongly in, in what they felt was true that they weren't afraid of the dogma. They weren't afraid of the consequences of their beliefs. So we feature a lot of people who feel strongly about certain subjects and, and I'm really excited to give them uh, a platform. I'm glad. Today we're gonna to be discussing the honeybee. What inspired you to talk about the honeybee and its symbolism? Well, you know, like many things, you don't set out to say, well, I think today I'm going to research the honeybee and, and see what I find. Yeah. It, it kind of comes to you, and it's, it's sort of a complicated story, but I'll try to, to um, keep it pretty, pretty simple because I was really interested in a lot of esoteric subjects. So I became connected with a very famous Kabbalist in uh, Catalan in the north of Spain, and and she taught really famous people like Salvador Dali and Jean Cocteau. And I studied with her. And I was going to study something altogether different when we were having breakfast on our patio the first day of the study session when a bee flew around our breakfast table, huge bee. And we got to talking about bees. And I studied them for, you know, I must have studied them for two or three years before I ever Googled anything about them. I just studied them with this incredible um, woman, this capitalist, this um, esoteric, you know, master. Amazing. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> See that you always get that inspiration. That's so wonderful. And when we look at the honeybee today, we see it like, like within the last 100 years, like we see it in fashion, for instance, like... There was a hairstyle that was used to call the beehive, and we see yeah. for movies and cinema about bees, like there was one called the bee, the bee movie, or Winnie the Pooh, right? Yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, the, the, the hairstyle is part of the, the modern-day kind of um, memory of the bee. So Lana Del Rey um, is, a, is a really, really good example of someone today who, who keeps the beehive hairstyle alive that was so popular in the 50s, and Amy Winehouse, of course. Um, and you mentioned Winnie the Pooh. You know, Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh is a bear, of course, right? And the bear's biggest enemy um, is the bee. The bee's biggest enemy is the bear. Mm -hmm. And so the bear was called Bee Wolf. And that's where that famous epic English poem, Beowulf, comes from, which wow. is kind of interesting. It is. Certainly. It's really interesting. But we always see it in our culture and that's what I and that's why we need to step back and go back in history a little and go to the prehistorical and ancient viewpoint of the sacred honeybee. Let's discuss this. So which gods or goddesses are associated with a honeybee? 
Well, it's a really interesting question. So, I mean, famous ones like Artemis, um, um, Diana, um, a lot of the goddesses of the Greek era are all associated with the honeybee. And, and, and it goes back much further than that. In ancient Egypt, the goddess Neith um, was associated with the honeybee. In fact, she lived in Egypt in a place called the House of the Bee. Um, and right down on the other side of the village, the Egyptian god Osiris was buried in the mansion of the bee. And, and, and ancient Egypt, the area around the pyramids was called Tabiti, the land of the bee. The pharaoh's title, the, the king of Egypt, his title was always the beekeeper. And there's a picture of the bee in the pharaoh's royal signature. But nobody ever talks about the bee in the context of ancient history. It's almost as though it's been airbrushed and people haven't noticed that it was a really big part of what the ancients believed in and, 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 and venerated. Mm -hmm. Well, since the ancients, well, one example of the ancients is in, like, in relation to ancient Egypt is for the bees, like the bees were formed from the tears of raw, right? Yeah, so, so you have, I, I, mean, I mentioned um, Neith, who is this goddess that goes way back, sort of 3000 BCE. She's one of the first goddesses. And her father was this chap called Ra. So the, in, 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 in Egypt, they rated all their kind of gods. Here's the most powerful. Here's the second most powerful. The top guy was Ra, and he cried bees as tears. Um, which is really interesting. And a couple of years ago, uh, Hugh Newman, who you, you may know, asked yeah. me to speak at... I interviewed him. <laughs> yeah, he's a really good yeah, guy. Yeah, of course. It was a wonderful interview. <laughs> yeah. And, and so he asked me to speak at Megalithomania. And, and he said, Andy, can you talk about bees, but also talk about stones? Uh, okay. Um, so I've always really been into um, stone circles and standing stones. But stone circles in particular, I've always noticed they're not really round. You know, I mean, these, the ancients could have made them perfectly round, but they're no, they're kind of tear shaped. So I looked into who is the god of circles, and it was Ra, and he's the god who cries bees as tears, and that tear shaped circle is what you see in stone circles. So there's a whole kind of detailed and, and sort of boring conversation about that. I'll, I'll spare you with it. But um, it kind of associates the god Ra with stone circles and with bees. Wow, that is amazing. And also, and there was, the bee has actually been featured on the rules of the stone, correct? Yeah, so I mean, it's one of the most interesting things to me, and I get really boring about this, so apologies in advance. But you have this little city in, in, in the Egyptian delta where Neith lived. It's called Sais. And so Neith lived there in the house of the bee. Osiris, this amazing god of resurrection in ancient Egypt, was buried there in the mansion of the bee. The Rosetta Stone comes from the village of Rosetta, um, not far away. But in like the 1940s, they moved a bunch of blocks, a bunch of stones from Sais to Rosetto. So the Rosetta stone is actually from Sais um, originally, and it has a bee on it, mm -hmm. which, is, which is lovely. But the thing that's really interesting is that Sais is the only place in history, the only one mm -hmm. where, the, where the legend of Atlantis comes from. Um, and that is where the stone, the Rosetta Stone, comes from that has the bee on it. And the Rosetta Stone, of course, has three, um, the same text in three languages, uh, opening up our world to the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. So Sais is a very magical place. It's all about bees. It's all about the legend of Atlantis. And that's where the Rosetta Stone is from. Wow. And talking, and you just mentioned Atlantis. Everyone is always intrigued by the legend of Atlantis. What are your insights on the legend? And where do you believe Atlantis could have been located? Well, that's a, those are excellent questions. And nobody really knows. But people just, when they talk about it, they always forget the fact that it was only ever mentioned in one place. In the entire world, one place. And that's in Egypt, in Sais. And... Um, the Greek lawgiver, 
Solon goes to, to Sais, and the Egyptians mm-hmm. say, oh, come look at the pillar. And the pillar tells the story of the lost civilization who is decimated by an incredible cataclysm. Um, and it happened 9,600 years ago. But what people don't realize is that in Egypt, in that location, the priest used lunar years. So every month was a year. So a year, as we know it, was 12 years. So if you divide 9,600, when they said Atlantis existed by 12, Mm -hmm. it puts you right at the time when Thera in the Aegean by Crete erupted. So I think Atlantis could very well have been the Minoan civilization on Crete. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a very ni- a good opinion. Uh, yeah, you have a point. And, well, since we're actually talk, I was thinking of talking a little bit about one of the ancient Egyptian symbols that is called the Ankh. I saw the, yes. the article that I was reading. It was a really great article, I must say. It was really well done. Could you please tell us about that, please? <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you. So, so the ink is like one of the trendiest symbols. You see it everywhere. I'm surprised you don't have one on your your, your charm necklace there. I mean, everyone wears an ink, and and you know, nobody really knows what these ancient symbols um, were, and and it, it's always been sort of held up to the mouth of the pharaoh, um, and you know. It has this connotation of stability and regeneration. And I I kind of argue um, that a lot of these ancient Egyptian symbols had to do with bees. Um, And we have just sort of forgotten that. Um, One of the classics is, is a lot of the early Egyptian gods are holding a staff. Um, and the staff has um, a shape like this on one end and a straight edge on the other. And keep in mind, the pharaoh's title is beekeeper. There's a picture of the bee in their royal signature. Um, they live in the land of the bee. And their death mask, look at Tutankhamun. We've all seen his death mask. What is it? Yellow and black horizontal stripes. Come on, he's the bee king. So, but this... The staff, no one knows what it's for, but it's identical. I mean, identical Mm -hmm. to what the beekeepers use today Um, because this sort of um, pointy bit is used to get um, uh, uh, the the, the elements inside the hive out so you can get the honey, and the straight bit is used to kind of scrape the honey out of the hive. So I think so much of what is are these iconic symbols today from ancient Egypt really relate to uh, to beekeeping? Wow! See, traditions are never lost. <laughs> they just get forgotten and kind of twisted, but they're never lost. You're right. Right, exactly. They might get forgotten, but they're still here in our culture, embedded right in there. But I was thinking about. Actually, I read in your article that was well done that you say the bees position in the do- Dog and Zodiac is significant to esoteric thought leaders such as Kabbalists. Could you please tell us how the bee played a role for the dog on people? Yeah, so, I mean, so much about the, the bee's importance in, 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 in uh, various cultures has been forgotten because it's been highly stylized. But with respect to the dogon, um, it's very interesting that in the position of the Zodiac, like what, so what sign are you, for instance? I'm a Virgo. I'm Cancer. You're a Cancer. Okay, fantastic. In the spot where Libra is, in the Dogen uh, constellation, there wasn't Libra. There was a bee. How interesting. Which is, and but you, know, the records are so difficult to, uh, to 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 understand. It's not clear if there was if it was a bee instead of Libra or the bee followed Libra, but the bee was really important to them. And you can see the bee in, in their, uh, their art, but I'll tell you why so many images of the bee from old Europe to Mesopotamia to Egypt aren't really 
recognizable as being bees is because they're shown dancing. Wow. And that's because the bees mm -hmm. dance. It's called the waggle dance. They do this kind of figure eight. It's the original form of satellite navigation. It's like, okay, guys, I'm going to tell you where the food is, where the flowers are. Watch this. I'm going to dance for you, and now you'll know how to find it. And, and Plato, Aristotle, they wrote about it. So the ancients knew that the bee could dance. And then you have statistics that 83% of all ancient images from early Egypt backwards are dancing women. And that's, I think, because the mother goddess, the original sort of goddess of all time, um, about 25, 26, 27,000 BCE, we find the Venus figure of the mother goddess, orange, laden in honey, as so though she's the queen bee. So the mother goddess becomes the queen bee, and all of a sudden, goddesses have bee characteristics, one of which is their dancing. Another, and this is a really interesting one, if you go to Kenosis, so you look in the Aegean, here's another characteristic you're looking at a bee goddess. That is, the waist is silly. The waist is tiny, tiny, tiny. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, just normal body, um, upper body, normal, lo normal lower body, tiny little waist. Why is that? It's because the bee's abdomen is so skinny. The rest of the body is normal size, and the bee's abdomen is really tiny. And the last, or one of the last of the three sort of main characteristics that you're looking at a bee goddess, one is her dancing, two, they have a skinny waist, uh, ab abnormally so, and three is they're wearing a horizontal striped skirt or dress, usually seven layers of stripes, usually alternating yellow and black, because there's seven layers, because there's six or seven layers in the bee's abdomen. And I know that sounds really crazy, but you can go back through Sumerian, Egyptian, and other ancient cultures and see that it, that's what they did. That's what they used. Wow, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you, Yoke, and there was a circle of bees that was on a figure, like circle of bees, and could you please be so kind to tell us more about this in depth? Yeah, so th there's two places I think are really interesting. One's in, in Chapel Hewitt in Turkey, and one's in Australia, in Aboriginal Australia. Okay. And, and in Australia, you find in the most sacred Aboriginal temple an entire wall that has nothing but a honeycomb design. And it's interesting. It's especially interesting since it's 8,000 8, BCE. So that's Aboriginal Australia, which is really interesting. And, and they're really big into honey hunting there. Uh, they're not necessarily beekeepers, but they're hunting for natural wild honey. And there's pictures of them running with honey sacks over their shoulder and carved on eucalyptus tree um, bark. But in Turkey and Chatelhuyuk, like you mentioned, there's also a wall that has the honeycomb uh, design. So why? Um, and in Chateau Hewitt, you have this fantastic image of a hunter, um, but he's kind of in a shamanic state. If you look at his body, he's doing this. He's running, but on top of his head is what I argue is the first ever halo. In the history of the world, it's the first halo. It's the first circle around someone's head, and the circle around the head is bees. And How interesting. We, you know, um, halo comes from the word hero, and there's no better definition of a hero than a hunter who brings home the food. Um, but again, he's in a shamanic state, and that underscores the fact that bees and their honey in the ancient world were, was really powerful. It was a drug, a hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic drug, like mushrooms or um, ayahuasca, it would really, it would really mess, mess you up. Yeah, it would. Um, and there's a great story of the Romans uh, under General Pompey, 
charging into Anatolia and they outnumber the poor Anatolians like a thousand to one. It's ridiculous, right? And they're coming to kill them. Um, but the local people know where the mad honey is, honey that will get you drunk. So they take these honeycombs and they put them out for the Romans to eat because I know the Romans will be hungry. And they go and hide. And the Romans come and they're like, wow, look at all this honey. Uh, and they eat it. But they get so drunk off the honey that they're stumbling around. And the local Anatolians in Turkey come back and just slaughter them because they're all kind of, you know, off their heads. Mm -hmm. So that quality of the honey is, is very interesting. That It could also be really powerful to consume. Mm -hmm. And I just want to mention something. There, could you please be so kind to tell us about this, the cave of spiders in Spain and how the honeybees were related? Yeah, we know. I might go there in a couple of weeks, so I'm really excited. But how interesting! Yeah, you have to go. <laughs> I know. I must. I'm, I've been talking about it forever. But the cave of the spider near Valencia is a World Heritage Site, and it's really, really old. You know, maybe fifteen thousand years old. Wow. Um, no one's quite sure. But on the walls, they have a depiction of honey hunting. Um, and honey hunting is something that hasn't changed in 15,000 years. You can see images today of honey hunters in Nepal, Malaysia, and the Cave of the Spider in Valencia. And it's all the same thing. It's, it's somebody risking life and limb, climbing up a cliffside, mm -hmm. hanging on, reaching out to get that, that valuable honey and bring it back. Um, and, and, you know, that shows us, that's the earliest depiction of honey hunting in the, in the world. And, you know, so why would someone risk dying for honey? Um, and the answer is it, you know, it has nutritional quality. Um, it has ritualistic quality. You use it in, in beer and in wine and, 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 um, Alexander the Great is said to have been buried in honey, and honey was part of what the Egyptians used to mummify the dead. Um, it was such a multi-purpose thing that people were willing to... Remember, there was no sugar then, so that was your sweetener as well. Um, made the coffee taste better. So it had all these different purposes that meant that somebody was willing to die for it. Wow. But yeah, the health benefits of honey until this day is this incredible. Like it can help mm. with viruses, prevent cancers, and more. <laughs> That's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, everyone talks about the bees dying. Oh uh, yes, I, I wanted to talk about that particularly with you because this is a very serious issue. I am just dis, dis worried about this issue because this can cause, like for example, Albert Einstein said it correctly. He said it right on. If a bee disappeared off the face of Earth, man would only have four years left to live. Exactly. That's exactly what's happening here. And I'm just really worried about what's happening to them because if that happens, we die, right? And mm -hmm. most of the food that mm. they're pollinating is what we eat today, right? And Monsanto has caused a lot of trouble. For instance, where I live, like, they're planting corn left and right where it gets uh -oh. terrible for the, and the pesticides, the spraying for those poor bees. I'm just like, how could this happen? Like, this is this, because they should know what they're doing. These are such important animals, Andrew. You, you, I'm just like, oh, this shouldn't be happening because people mm. should find out about this because it's going to cause a lot of issues, certainly. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's upsetting on so many different levels. I mean, um, the economic hit would be multiple billion, but that's not the half of it. Um, uh, I argue it's the loss of the tradition. We, we lose it forever, and we practically have already lost it because people don't think of the bee as being sacred, really. So who's killing the bee and why is it dying? I mean, CCD, colony collapse disorder, um, most likely is due to the pesticides yeah. hurting the bee's immune system. It gets weak. And then like humans, when it's weak, other things kind of kill it. Um, 
and certainly the pesticides are to blame. Um, what, what I find a little weird is every six weeks, watch it, every six weeks you'll see it come across the wire that mobile phones are, are causing the bees to die. And that could be another reason, of course. I don't, I mean, it doesn't really resonate with me. Um, but something that's really interesting is that this great esoteric genius from Germany, Rudolf Steiner, said in 1923, he had these series of 10 lectures about bees. And he was just epic. He was so epic. There's nobody like him on earth today. He was just an amazing genius and a great beekeeper. And he said in 1923 that in starting in 1908, so 15 years before that day, that the way that people look after the bees has changed. You're starting to feed the queen bee artificially. Um, you don't let bees swarm. That's their ecosystem. Half of them leave the hive and go for them. And, you know, you stop that. The drones who impregnate, uh, impregnate the king, uh, the queen, um, you manipulate them, and and you manipulate the queen, and more than anything else, you put the bees. You don't let the bees go in the tree. You put them in a box. So he said, on, on trays in a box. Bees are not creatures of boxes. They don't live on trays. They live in the trees. Um, so he said. In a hundred years' time, from two, from 1908, give it 100 years, and the bees will die. So in 2008, 65% of the bees in the United States were already dead. And he said they would start to die mm -hmm. because of the way they're being treated. So it's interesting that the greatest genius of the past hundred years says the beekeepers will die. The bees will die because of the beekeepers. Yep. But That's a bit, it's a bit weird. Yeah. Well, I just hope that they can make a comeback and everything will be okay for our society today. <laughs> yes. And, and, um, Monsanto bad. We need to, uh, we need to stop that. Yeah. We, sure. we need to, you know, the EPA needs to really clamp down on them. We need to find a solution. Mm. That's the big, big, that's exactly what we need to do. And a solution is always a, a fair conclusion <laughs> to this because we need to stop it before it's too late. Yeah, yeah. It's already getting late. <laughs> there, there's signs that they're coming back and you, you hear, yeah. you know, encouraging things all the time. So fingers crossed. But now it's hard, like, I don't see that many bees in my area anyway, and I don't see any flies. Flies are pesky little animals, and you think they could come out. <laughs> but they're hiding from you. <laughs> when the flies start to disappear, that's serious, because they are determinal insects. <laughs> that's really funny. That's funny. We know bees have been recognized as special um, for a hundred million years. And, and that's because we have pieces of amber. You know amber. You probably have um, amber ju jewelry. Yeah, um, of course. Bees, bees have been found petrified in amber, 100 million years old. And because they're petrified in am amber, the ancients must have thought, hey, it looks like that bee is, is preserved in its own secretion. Honey, um, wow, that's so symbolic. That's amazing. It is. The longest time bees have been regarded as special. Yeah, and actually, we could actually look at the country France for a minute because when wow. we look at France, it's like in the shape of a hexagon, right? And it's strange, but the honeycomb is like constructed are like in hexagons. In France, the bee played an important role because Napoleon's nickname was the bee. Exactly. Why? Why was Napoleon's nickname the bee? <laughs> well, it's a very good question. You ask really tough questions, and I, I think you know, like the most famous, most famous generation of French kings were somebody called the Merovingians, and they were these long-haired kings who were supposedly descendants of Jesus Christ, and thus they had special sort of um, um, ascension to become king. Of, of France, and some of the really famous ones, like Dagobert, um, 
Clovis. The, they were discovered buried with 300 gold bees in their tomb. So Napoleon kind of wanted to associate himself with that great lineage of kings before him. So, so he made the bee well, his nickname, but also bees on his clothes, bees on his carpets, his robes, his, his furniture. And oh. it just, you know, you go to Versailles and there's bees everywhere. He wouldn't be crazy. <laughs> he wouldn't be crazy. And, and, you know, so the bee is a really common coat of arms um, in France as well. And, and like, like you say, they recognize that their country was shaped like, you know, a beehive shape. Um, but my favorite is that during the time of Napoleon, it was common knowledge that the fleur de lis was a stylized bee. Amazing. So you look at a fleur de lis, it's one of the most famous images in the world. You see it in every, you see it everywhere. You see it in churches, you see it um, any place of kind of any sort of royalty. There is the fleur de lis, but the fleur de lis represents a bee, um, which is one of those things about the bee that's been forgotten. It's always depicted as being really stylized. Mm, wow. Because it's dancing or it represents a goddess or. Yep. Yeah. That sort of thing. Oh yeah, I understand completely. Yeah, it, it usually is looked upon as that, of course. And and I was actually something just came to my mind. Actually, um, I was thinking about the oracle stone that resembles the beehive, right? Mm -hmm. Like resemble a beehive? Yeah, it's like the most famous oracle stone in history is. The and so Delphi's in Greece, and. Mm -hmm. All mythology sort of talks about the priest of Delphi and the priestesses came from Minoan Crete. They came in boats singing tunes about bees. Literally, that's what the mythology says. And as soon as they arrive, everything becomes about the bees. The priestess is called the Delphic bee. And honey is a big part of their ritual. And they have the world's most famous oracle stone. It's huge. It's about four or five feet tall, but it's shaped exactly like a beehive. Amazing. And it has crisscrossing rows of bees on it. And it even has a little hole down on the bottom. So it could have actually been a real functioning beehive. And oh, interesting. No one's ever noticed it. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That is and, incredible. <laughs> and it was the greatest oracle center, you know, in, in the world. Um, people would go there and ask to have insight. It's like you wanted a tarot reading in the ancient world, you went to Delphi. Um, you wanted to have your palms read, you went to Delphi. And, you know, that's where they would use the oracle stone, shaped like a beehive, and bee priestesses who use honey in their rituals to talk to the spirit world to get the answer for their customers, it was, you know, it was all about the bees. Dionysus <laughs> was the god of grapes, but you claim that it looks like beehives. Well, boy, you are so good. I mean, that's, that's a really um, tough one because the, um, one of the original words for grapes means hive, um, I'm sorry, it means swarm. And I wonder, so many things have been mistranslated from ancient languages into Hebrew, into French, into English. It's amazing more hasn't been mistranslated. Um, and my, my favorite example, without getting all weird, is, is uh, Noah the great biblical hero of the flood. You've seen the movie probably recently uh, in the last couple of years with, um, oh, what's his name? The great uh, Australian actor plays Noah. But anyway, it was like a huge flood that's gonna cause the whole world to go underwater, right? So Noah builds a boat, he puts all the animals on it, and he goes off in this arduous journey. He completes the journey, and the Old Testament, the Bible, what does it say? he needed a drink. So the, the first thing he does is he plants a vineyard. Um, well, a vineyard 
the ground is all wet. How can you plant a vineyard? Um, so if the ground was normal, it would take two or three years before you had a really nice harvest. But the next thing you know, Moses, the Old Testament says, is in his tent, passed out, drunk. He couldn't make it to his bed, which is a really weird thing to yeah. say. And you can't tell me that the man who built this boat and got all those animals in it and went out on this incredible journey can't handle a drink. I think he can. Um, so what I think is he was drinking something that had honey in it. Remember we were talking earlier, honey has that special quality that it's kind of like a drug. Um, and yeah. he, didn't, he didn't know how strong it would be and it just knocked him out. Wow. So, so Dionysus is, is the, the god of grapes. But what if, you know, the ancient word for grape was mistranslated because it seems like before grapes there was honey and that was the original ingredient in any ancient beverage. Amazing. Well, you have a very good theory on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the bee, let's go, let's look at the bee and like let's go north for a moment with the bee, right? And st let's check out Scandinavian cultures in the United Kingdom. How was their intake on the bee? Scandinavian cultures. Well, um, it's interesting because the bee is regarded as a hero um, mm, in in um, Nordic cultures, Scandinavian cultures. Remember we talked about how um, mm -hmm. the biggest adversary of the bee is the bear who eats the hives. Oh, yes. I was uh, that. <laughs> and that's why the bear was called bee wolf. And that's where the name Beowulf came from, this really ancient English poem. Now, a really ancient Scandinavian poem is called the Kalevala. And in the Kalevala, it talks about how the hero dies and the hero's mother sends a bee up into space <laughs> to get the ingredient that will allow her son to be resurrected. Um, so the bee is the hero of Scandinavian culture. Amazing. Just like the bee is the hero of Mayan culture, when the gods go into the underworld and the sun is killed and the sun's head is cut off, it's very gross and, and, and graphic. Yeah, and, this. <laughs> and, and the bee takes the, um, the head back out of the underworld Mm -hmm. And it, it turns into corn, and the corn turns into people, and the world is saved. The bee is the hero. Um, and happens again in Mesopotamian culture uh, with, the, well, with the Hittites, the bee is the hero. So it's interesting how something so small can have such a big impact on, um, on so much. Mm -hmm. It does have a big impact. Bees are everywhere you look. <laughs> yes. Well, you, you wrote in your article on your website, andrewgoff.co.uk, on the article called Bedazzled, Sumerian wing tradition by depicting bulls with wings. And talking about the bull and the horrific religion, they would slaughter bulls. The bulls continue to be slaughtered in bull fights. Could you please elaborate more for my audience? Oh, you do pick the, the, the tough ones. No easy ones from you. Um, you know, in the old days, so in the UK, we have Sky TV. That's what, that's what our cable's called, Sky. Um, but in the old days, there, there was no Sky TV. The Sky was the TV. Um, and so the ancients all over the world would look into the sky and talk about what they imagined the, saw, the stars represented. Um, the Milky Way was always a river, et cetera. Um, but in the sky is a hunter killing a bull. How interesting. Or at least that's what the ancients saw. And they drew it, they wrote about it. And you can imagine some reverential, um, probably religious community saying, okay, we're gonna act out a play here on earth, on the ground that mimics what we see in the sky, a man killing a bull. So killing a bull became 
a ritual associated with sort of an early religion, Mithraism. And they had temples, and they had temples in Spain, for instance. And what we find is that built over these Mithra temples, where they used to slaughter bulls because they thought it was a sacred thing to do, built over those are bull rings. And bull rings, of course, is where the matador challenges the bull and, yes, in Greek. you know, hopefully the bull wins. Um, I'm going to Madrid uh, next week, so I will be avoiding the bull rings. But, but um, the point is, this tradition of many things, um, much of what we think is kind of real, is real, but was first inspired by something people saw in the sky, such as killing bulls. Yeah, and that comes from the sky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And what is the significance of the horns of the bulls? Oh, gosh, you go from tough to, to impossible. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, I mean, in this special sacred place called a shamanic state where priests and shamans go, one of the forms of protection when you go into this other consciousness is animals with horns. Now, wise men for thousands of years have known that. Um, and you start seeing this shape, not only in dancing goddesses of Sumerian and Egyptian, they're all doing this, um, but also in the Minoan capital in Kenosis, you have the horns of consecration. Um, the capital, what I, what I argue is Atlantis, has this shape everywhere. It has it on um, buildings, it has it on temples, homes. And what's interesting is no one knows what it represents. Hmm. But it's because they haven't really delved deep enough. What this shape really means is please protect me from the evil eye. Now you think, well, that sounds weird. What's the evil eye? Today, today in Greece, when they harvest honey and they take it out of the hive, they do that at night because they're afraid of the evil eye. And the evil eye is, if I had the evil eye, I could look at you and go, um, you're going to have a bad day at school tomorrow. Um, but people have always felt that that was real. Mm -hmm. And protection against it is this. So uh, you see that shape everywhere. Dancing goddesses, ancient cities have that shape over all their buildings. It's really interesting. Today in Greece, in Italy, they continue to use it as a form of protection. And it goes back to animals that were seen in that sacred consciousness when you pray, when you go into the, the other world. Mm -hmm. Could you please tell us about the almond so for those who may not know? The... Um, the almond soul. Oh, right. Gosh. Yes. So, I mean, there's so many ways to pronounce it, and I always mispronounce everything. It's about <laughs> a trademark. Um, so, <laughs> no, no. The, the, the Ehrman souls are these very much like what you've been talking about, these, divide, um, these interesting sort of shapes like that um, that many people think are associated with Atlantis. And what they are, if you really delve into Ehrman souls, uh, if you look at the original definition of them and the original pictures of them, mm -hmm. you see these towers uh, in the forest. And I've been there like in Germany. That's where most of the Ehrman souls are. Mm -hmm. And the earliest definition of an Ehrman soul is a tree trunk. How interesting. Erected in the open air. And today, if you asked somebody, what's, what's the purpose of a tree trunk erected in the open air? And they would say, well, that's what a beekeeper does to attract bees who have swarmed. Um, so that's interesting. But, but these airman souls, the old images we have of them, show them in round towers. So if you ever come to the UK and you go to Scotland, 
um, or Ireland, uh, or if you go to places like Sardinia, there's these round towers everywhere. And people are like, what are these round towers doing there? Because they're not defensive. They're not domestic. People didn't live there. They're not storage. What were they? Well, the Minoans have these tiny little seals that show round towers. And we have coins from all kinds of ancient cultures, ancient coins that show round towers, all with trees in the round tower. So nobody knows, but I speculate, could it be a sacred tree that needs to be protected from the, the, the weather? Might it be a tree that the bees would use to, to you know, procreate, to, to pollinate, to, to sustain themselves during, you know, less favorable climates? So no one knows what these, these air missiles were. Um, and of course, as you might guess, I know it's hard to believe, I think they have something to do with bees. Yes, that's, you have a point, of course. And another thing that could be about bees, which I want to ask you, is do you think that the Sphinx was a bee goddess? <laughs> I laugh because you're so well-researched, and that is another tough one. Okay, so the Sphinx had all these complicated names. I couldn't even begin to pronounce them. I mean, it's been around for a long time, right? At least 2800 BCE, probably many thousands of years before that. And the Minoans that we're talking so much about, we have lost their language. We don't know their language, except for one word. And that one word is their word for B. Hmm, that's strange. <laughs> Very strange. I'm lucky, I'm lucky. And now, lucky, yeah. so the Minoans taught, the Minoans were incredible beekeepers. That's, that was their main economy. Um, they taught the Greeks everything they know about beekeeping. Yeah. So the Greeks walk into Cairo and they see this amazing dog, lion figure, the Sphinx, but it's not called the Sphinx. The Greeks named the Sphinx, Sphinx. And the one word we know from the Minoans who taught the Greeks everything they know about beekeeping that means bee is S-P-H-E-X. And I'm not saying the Sphinx was built as a bee goddess, but I think when the Greeks saw it, they knew it, they recognized it as being a bee goddess. And the reason why sort of a Sphinx image is associated with a bee is that the goddess is always sort of protected on either side by two lions, uh, two griffins, two pillars, two very sacred things always protect the goddess. And they became associated with the goddess. And so the Sphinx, gosh knows what it was built for, whether it was a dog or a lion. I'm pretty sure the Greeks recognized it as a bee goddess. Amazing. But that sounds like you have a point. And... <laughs> Could you please be so kind to tell us about the snake goddess? Ooh, the snake goddess. I'm not really good with snake goddesses, but... You did talk about that on one of your conferences. I did. I did. You're right. So, the um, uh, again, on Crete, you know, Crete is just an amazing island in the Aegean that has so much incredible... It has everything you would expect from Atlantis, really it has everything that you would ever hope Atlantis would have. Maybe. That's why I think it's Atlantis. Of course, um, you have a point. But they have they have um, these gods squeezing the heads of snakes just like this, and it's interesting because they're squeezing the snake's neck so hard you can just see it in the image, like they want it to to die. Um, but the Sanskrit, the ancient word for um, snake venom, which is really what's being called out in that image, is the same as opium. And so opium is this 
really powerful and once very popular drug that comes from poppies. So you, you lovely flower, that's where opium comes from. Opium is what a stronger drug called heroin comes from. And I argue that the Minoans who were really wealthy on Crete this, and Thera and the whole area, no one knows where their money came from. <laughs> but my research tells me they're growing poppies and they're making honey. Honey is wild and hallucinogenic. And well, the poppies make another kind of drug. I think they were putting those two together and selling them around the Aegean. So respectfully, I think the Minoans were the drug lords of the Aegean. They were the original sort of bad boys in the hood. I see, wow, that sounds really, yeah, unique, wow. <laughs> And to, to talk, let's talk a little bit about the mistress of Alambrus. Who is she? Could you please elaborate more for my audience? Oh, so, gosh. You, I, I don't get a break with these questions, do I? So <laughs> um, the capital of Crete, Crete's this big island in the Aegean, um, and the capital is called uh, Kenosis, and its name is the Palace of the Double Axe. Um, but double axe comes from the word L-A-B-R-Y-S, and that's the word that labyrinth comes from. Now, we've all seen all these movies about the labyrinth and this amazing sort of thing you have to kind of go through to get to. I mean, no one knows anything about it. Let's come on. Um, but if kenosis was... A honey factory and they're making bees everywhere all we know from history is that the king king minos his son died in a vat of honey these huge jars and the king's son fell in one and drowned um so you have labrys l-a-b-r-y-s which means double axe but the double axes sorry it's complicated the double axes in crete look like bees. You know, a double axe is a blade this way, a blade that way, and the idea is you could kill, usually the bull, faster if you had a blade on both sides. Um, but if you look at them, they're so feminine. They're not like a weapon of war. They're stylized bees. Wow. And, and, and so I argue the palace of the double axe the double axe is a bee, so that means that kenosis is the palace of the bee. And now that we have DNA, DNA, which is this amazing way of saying, I know exactly where you, know, you and your family and your family before them came from, Manoa Crete, their DNA only comes from one place, and that's Chatelhuac and Turkey, and then Chatelhuac the archaeologists who excavated say there's a lot of double axes here and they look a lot like bees. So it's kind of interesting. I think the labyrinth, to answer your question, never existed. Okay. Not like we know it. It was allegorical to a beehive. So if you look at the beehive and you look at um, a honeycomb, it's a labyrinth. And, That's true. And, and, and we only have one expression from the ancient, ancient Minoans, and that was, um, for everyone, honey, to the queen, the most honey. So I, I think the labyrinth was allegorical to the queen bee in her amazing hive. Wow, that sounds incredible. And you do have a point. Yeah, I never even thought of that. Never crossed my mind. You do have a point. <laughs> well, I hope you're not thinking about these things because they're really kind of strange. But if you had pictures, I mean, it's really, you go, oh, my God, labyrinth, beehive, they're identical um, in their shape and design. Oh, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was thinking maybe we could discuss a little bit about, like, what has bee wax been used for in the ancient times? What about that? 
Yeah, beeswax was always really um, important. I mean, it was used to create little mini statues called effigies. And not just like statues. Normal statues are kind of stone and they're, they're lovely and you see them in the temple and always in that nice. But effigies made, figures made with beeswax were magical. So it's kind of like, kind of like voodoo. So if I made this little, my phone into beeswax and I drew a face on somebody I didn't like and I took a little pin and went, the belief was that would actually happen to them in the real world. Um, so they were magical. And beeswax, of course, is what you use to make candles. And the Catholic Church today demands that a really high and certain percent of the wax in its candles has to be bee wax. Wow. That, that, yeah, you're correct, right. And another place that we see bees actually is actually in religion because it seems to be like, remember the, the, the saying, the land of milk and honey. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. And I, remember I was talking about how the first ever halo mm-hmm was bees circling yes. around the hunter's head. From Cattell, New York. Halo, exactly. And, and a halo is, you know, obviously very, very holy. Holy, uh, of course. <laughs> and there's all kinds of stuff. Like the oldest poem in the Bible is the Song of Deborah. But D-B-R-E, which is Deborah in Hebrew, means bee. So the oldest poem in the Bible is the Song of the Bee, which is amazing. The King James Bible mentions um, the bee 61 times. Um, the first thing that Jesus Christ ate after his crucifixion was honey. Um, when John's in the desert and he's trying to survive, he eats honey. Um, and speaking of John, it's interesting on the feast day of John the Baptist, I think it was 2004, a bee crop circle appeared uh, in England, which is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many examples. Uh, Christ, uh, Jesus Christ was known as the ethereal bee. And Artemis, you yeah, talked about one of your first questions, which goddesses are known as bee goddesses? Artemis, right. Athena. Well, Artemis, um, her sort of priest um, were known as um, uh, Essians um, and king bees. So so there's a whole tradition of bees um and religion. And I even wonder if some of the really old stuff, the Sumerian stuff, where you see these winged creatures that many people have theorized are, oh, they're extraterrestrials. Um, they're the original sort of earthlings who came down to, to make humans. No, 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 no. I mean, I think they're bees. Um, I went into the British Museum here in London uh, about three months ago, and I've always been fascinated by these fantastic images of like these from Samaria, these eagles, um, really scary looking, you know, 10 foot tall carvings. And on one hand, they have a pine cone, and the other hand, they have a bag. Now, Graham Hancock, others have all searched for the answer of what's in the bag. You go to old Mexico, you go to Samaria, you go to Egypt, any culture on the planet has their ancients carrying this purse, like a bag. So I'm trying to figure out what's in the bag. And just by chance, I see this, this old, old man leading a tour through the British Museum. And I stopped him, I said, excuse me, sir, sorry. You're an expert on Mesopotamia? Okay, great. What's in the bag? And he goes, mm-hmm. pollen. I'm like, pollen? He said, yeah, they're pollinating their kingdom. I'm like, well, what's the pine cone about then? And he said, no, no, it's not a pine cone. It's a date palm. They're dipping the date palm into the bag that has the pollen and symbolically pollinating their kingdom. Um, which is one of the major benefits of a bee is it goes around and pollinates, kisses, kisses all the flowers. And, you know, ancient uh, cultures who knew that bees would help their crops grow 
they flourished. Those who didn't kind of make that connection, they didn't do so well. Mm -hmm. And also, it beats on this play and poem role in religion and culture, but what about in secret societies? Which secret societies have a bee been linked to? Wow. Okay. Well, perhaps the most famous one of all is the Illuminati. Right. And that's very famous. Yeah. I mean, that is the major secret society. And um, I should be drinking some honey, actually, as we have a bit of a cold. So if you hear me losing my voice, somebody send some honey, please. Yes. <laughs> and honey, honey and tea, and I'll be fine. But, but, um, We were just talking about the secret society. Secret society. See, I start talking about honey and tea, and I lose, I lose the thread. No, so you're not. <laughs> the guy who created um, the Illuminati, Adam Wishwaput, on May 1st, which is the Workers' Day, Labor Day, the Worker Bee Day, mm -hmm. um, the Day of Taurus the Bull, he launched the Illuminati in 1776. But he was a bit sad because the name he wanted to choose for the Illuminati was already taken. He wanted to call it bees. I mean, imagine if there was no concept of Illuminati. Instead of Illuminati, you're thinking about the people who really run the White House, the people who are um, the, the real puppet masters of the prime ministers all around the world. And your prime minister is amazing. What a great guy. Um, it would have changed everything. He wanted to name them bees. But bees also have a really important role in other secret societies besides the Illuminati. And one of them is Freemasonry. Um, because the Freemasonry and politics are directly related to the bee because the bee's role is everyone has a job and everyone knows what their job is and nobody strives to have a better job, they know what their job is and they're happy. It's an ecosystem that really works. Um, and Freemasonry adopted that. You see on uh, George Washington's apron, his Masonic apron, uh, his regalia, there's a picture of a beehive. Um, a lot of the language in Freemasonry talks about the importance of regular, orderly society, um, which is what you find in a beehive. And they talk about bees explicitly. So bees influenced secret societies. And they also, you know, influence politics because, again, uh, especially communism, where people may not have an opportunity for a really good job. They have to be the proletariat. They have to do the, the worker bee thing. But they should be happy because they have a role. And, and so that analogy was was really popular in things in, in you know the 18th and early 19th centuries well since we have some more time I thought maybe we could discuss something about uh, the symbolism of the salmon in the ancient times in biblically oh gosh we're talking about salmon. we're leaving the bee and we're talking about salmon I just thought maybe it was cool because I found it on your website if you want to Sure, sure. I mean, I have always been fascinated by salmon. I remember once, um, probably 20 years ago, I was in Scotland and I was watching the salmon jump in the stream. They, they jump, you know, uh, you, you know what they're like. You've seen the pictures. Of course I have. But these young boys, they must have been about 10 or 12, were catching the salmon and throwing them. And I remember yelling at them, no, leave the salmon be. Um, but it got me thinking, you know, what causes a salmon who is born here and travels, you know, a thousand miles over there to all of a sudden change its whole physical body um, to shrink its stomach so it only survives on its own urine? Eh. Because uh, it has to be really stealth as it heads back to its home. And it's going upstream, up 15-foot waterfalls. Um, it's no wonder, I mean, I found that this incredible fish has been venerated um, from the Middle East 
to uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, to Canada, all over the world. Canada loves the salmon, and I, yeah. and I, you know, it's it's such an interesting um, creature. Nobody knows how it does it. How can it find its way back home, which could be a thousand miles? Um, and why does it feel compelled to find it? And they, they think that when it was born, it re, it takes a memory of the smell of the area, and it does sort of a geomagnetic imprint. Like I'm going to do a sat nav. I'm going to put the Google pin here, so wherever I go, I'll know how, how to get back to the Google pin. Um, but I also wonder sometimes, do we have that same ability? Do we have that same drive um, to go back? You know, have we lived multiple times? Um, maybe sometimes you've been someplace and you said, wow, this is really cool. I, I, I'm really excited to be here. Um, then other times you go someplace on a holiday and you're like, God, this is really weird. It's like I've been here before. It feels like I've, I know this place. You know, do we have some innate ability to kind of find our home um, wherever that once was? The salmon does. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it is really interesting. And I was thinking maybe... I actually, did you know, I actually interviewed, uh, recently interviewed a dear friend of mine by the name of Graham Phillips about his new book about the lost tomb of King Arthur. I thought since, I just came to my mind, what about, since since you were on that documentary on Forbidden History, what are your thoughts on the King Arthur legend? Well, first of all, um, you know, I, I bow to Graham. He's, uh, I think he's the world expert on uh, King Arthur. He's of also course. a good friend and, and uh, I think he's He's amazing. He's amazing. Yes, I have to agree with you 100%. Amazing. Yeah. And yeah. I love his book, by the way, too. He's oh, it, it's really good. And, and, and it, um, I, I've been a, a fan of his books for, you know, since he's been, been writing them. And his presentations are, are really, are really wonderful. Um, so I've done a lot of documentaries, uh, The Truth Behind King Arthur for National Geographic and... Forbidden History and and many others on Arthur and, and my view is um, not really a popular one and it's kind of like the man killing the bull. Oh, I see. I think that Arthur and the twelve knights of the Round Table and the twelve battles that he fought. Um, are all reflective of what's in the sky and the fact that somebody first writes about him in the 6th century um, but it's a couple hundred years before they mention his name a couple hundred years later they mention his name then a couple hundred years after that someone talks about Camelot and then they mention Guinevere, and all of a sudden there's a sword and a chalice, and by the 15th century, it's rock and roll Hollywood. It's an amazing story. And I, I think there probably was um, a great king who defended Britain against the Saxons. Um, but I think the King Arthur legend is uh, as above, so below. Um, and that's why you have Scotland and Wales and England and Ireland and Italy and France and Russia um, all saying, oh, he's mine. He's mine. He's from, he's from here. Um, and it's because I think he's an archetype. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, but that king who defended the people um, of Britain from the Saxons. I think Graham has just nailed it. Yes, As, yes. You know, where he lived, where he died, and I think that's, that's fantastic. You know, we need more historical in the field, stepping on cow dung 
uh, historical detectives and not people Googling, you know, get out there and, 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 and go look for it. And, and that's what he does, and that's what makes Graham so great. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. I have to agree with you 100% on that. <laughs> and do you have any upcoming works that you have planned in the near future? Will you have any upcoming presentations? Well, it's very kind of you. I, I'm, I'm doing so much, so much television at the moment. So as we speak in North America, um, I'm on Forbidden History 3 on uh, the American um, Heroes channel, AHC, American History Channel. Mm -hmm. Also, Inside Secret Societies is on as we speak on um, the American History Channel. And um, Ancient Assassins is going to be uh, on the Discovery Channel mm -hmm. in a few months' time, so look for that. And in two days, I film um, a new series about ancient mysteries and uh, ancient Egypt. So doing a lot of TV, but you know what I really want to do is that documentary on the bee called The Hidden Hive of History. The Hidden Hive of History is my book that I'm still writing. Uh -huh. If I ever get like, you know, four months off of work, I'll write it all down. Um, so look for that. Um, my website, andrewgoff.com, is where all my writing um, and research is, and the hereticmagazine.com is where you can find all these cool new articles uh, yes. about by so and Graham Graham writes for it, so so things like that. Oh, he does. That's great. And what exactly do you have on the magazine? Like, what kind of topics? Do you yeah, I mean, really everything from um, mm -hmm. ancient Egypt to are, are aliens real, or are they just an, our imagination to um, uh, fairy tales and mythology and, and King Arthur? So well, it, it, a little bit for everyone. Yeah, then people will, it, it's, it's, uh, you have all, everything, and that's what I like. You know, there's a lot of things in there. And, I'm, and maybe you'll write for it someday. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You never know. <laughs> Anytime you want, let me know. Oh, you're really kind. That's really sweet of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm blushing. <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, uh, I just wanted to say something about your book. Uh, when do you have it? When do you plan to publish it? Just so I know. Well, it, it, day? it's <laughs> probably, probably a good good year away. Because what I'm trying to do, I know it sounds a bit silly, but today for a book to be really successful, like Graham's new book, he launched it on the back of the Forbidden History episode about King Arthur. So a lot of people see it. Oh, he's just written a book. So when I do my documentary on the bee, that's when I'll launch um, the book. So hopefully in a, a year, not too much more. Okay, that's good to hear. But I hope you get that published as thank soon you. as you can. Okay, so I, Andrew, I would like to thank you for making some time to come on to Crystal Kiss TV. It was an honor and a pleasure to interview you, and I hope to interview you again in the near future. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like that very much. It's been, been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Crystal Kids TV. I would like to thank everyone for listening. You can check out my website, www.crystalkidsradio.com or www.crystalkidstv.com for more. You can also like my Facebook page, Crystal Kids Radio, or follow me on Twitter by searching me up, Crystal Kids TV, or Nellie Marie Hawks Google+. Love, peace, and harmony. Love you all. <laughs>